Help us to put all the pieces together so that we can see a beautiful picture of who you are. In Christ's name, amen. All right. We're going to begin uh, with the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And I know um, a couple of people missed last time, and um, I can go over those with you later. Probably. Okay, so we're going to talk about the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. In Christ's life of perfect obedience to God's will, his suffering, death, and resurrection, God provided the only means of atonement for human sin, so that those who by faith accept this atonement may have eternal life. And the whole creation may better understand the infinite and holy love of the Creator. This perfect atonement vindicates the righteousness of God's law and the graciousness of His character. For it both condemns our sin and provides for our forgiveness. By dying, Christ took our place, canceled our debt, reconciled us to God, and transforms us. The resurrection of Christ proclaims God's triumph over the forces of evil, and for those who accept the atonement, assures their final victory over sin and death. It declares the Lordship of Jesus Christ, before whom every knee in heaven and on earth will bow. Christ's life, death, and resurrection reveal God's righteous character and make eternal life available to all who accept it. Only Christ could accomplish redemption. Those who accept Christ as Lord and Savior receive eternal life. Christ's life and death show that God deals justly with us. Through his death, Jesus provided atonement for us and demonstrated God's great love for us. In his resurrection, he triumphed over Satan and death. He died in my place. He bore the penalty for my sin in my place. He triumphed over Satan at his resurrection. Christ's life of perfect obedience and his atoning death show that obedience is possible as the Holy Spirit empowers us. Christ's resurrection provides assurance of eternal life for his children. Jesus obeyed God's law. Jesus' obedience and spirit empowering make our obedience possible. Recognizing God's great sacrifice on our behalf causes us to want to serve him. Jesus' resurrection assures ours. So personal application. Why does God want to give me eternal life? Anybody have an answer for that? Because he loves us? Absolutely. Because he can't live without us. Yep. He wants to spend eternity with us. Yes. Why couldn't anyone but God's son perform the ministry that Jesus did? Because he was without sin. Right. And he also was our creator. He made us. I thank God daily for his marvelous gift, the thought that Jesus was willing to leave the glory of heaven to come and live on this earth to save a sinner like me. Fills me with love for him and his victory in life and death encourages me to fight the good fight of faith. Commitment. Because I see your love revealed in your great sacrifice for me, I give my life to you. I accept your death in my place and trust you to lead me to eternal life. Any questions about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's clear. Thumbs up. Yep, thumbs up. Okay, very good. All right. The church. Okay, let me get that oh. one. It'll take oh. me a second. 
No, I skipped to just sorry. The experience of salvation is the next one. Okay. In infinite love and mercy, God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. Led by the Holy Spirit, we sense our need, acknowledge our sinfulness, repent of our transgressions, and exercise faith in Jesus as Lord and Christ as substitute and example. This faith which receives salvation comes through the divine power of the word and is the gift of God's grace. Through Christ, we are justified, adopted as God's sons and daughters, and delivered from the lordship of sin. Through the Spirit, we are born again and sanctified. The Spirit renews our minds and writes God's law of love in our hearts, and we are given the power to live a holy life. Abiding in him, we become partakers of the divine nature and have the assurance of salvation now and in the judgment. All human beings need to be saved. We are sinful by nature and need to admit and repent of our sins and receive Christ as our sinless substitute. We've all sinned and come short of God's glory. Our sinfulness alienates us from God. And alienation leads to further sin. The Holy Spirit points out our need for repentance. We need to recognize and admit our sinfulness. We need to repent. We cannot save ourselves. We need a Savior. Through faith, we receive our Savior who forgives us for our past, gives us assurance of eternal life, and brings about our adoption as sons and daughters of God, and gives us power to live holy lives. Faith and salvation are God's gift to us. We receive faith through hearing the word of God. By faith, we accept Jesus as our Savior. By faith, we receive forgiveness and justification. By faith, we are adopted as God's children. By faith, we are delivered from evil and given the assurance of eternal life. By faith, we are born again to a new life. By faith, we are changed to be more like God. By faith, we receive power to live a holy life. God has promised to write his law of love on our hearts and help us obey from the heart. God also promises to forgive us as we confess our sins. Personal application. Why is a Christian life called a new life? Because we are born again. Yes. We die to self when we live for Christ. Yes. Why is it impossible to live a holy life without God's power? Because we have a sinful nature. You know, um, a lot of people believe that you can pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps. But when it comes to having a relationship with God, we need his help to do that. We can't do it on our own. Okay, commitment. I recognize that by nature I am alienated from you, God. It is only because you have provided a Savior that I can receive eternal life. By faith, I accept your forgiveness, cleansing, and deliverance from sin. I accept your gracious offer of adopting me into your family and your power for living a holy life, Father. I look forward to spending eternity with you. Is that your response to God? Okay, we're going to look at the next one which is growing in Christ. I don't know about you, but, you know, uh, it, it's, you know, when our kids are little 
uh, when we were little, you know, we did, we did things as kids, you know, we didn't have maturity or thoughtfulness sometimes about what we did. And um, I think, you know, God wants us to continue growing in our, um, in being like him. So growing in Christ. By his death on the cross, Jesus triumphed over the forces of evil. Without his sacrificial death, Satan and his demonic forces would have not been defeated. The problem of sin would not have been solved. Death would not have been conquered. And the redemption of human beings from sin would not have been possible. Through his victory over sin and Satan on the cross, Jesus made it possible for human beings to be saved and reconciled to God. It is this reconciliation that has made us God's children. Being children, we have become inheritors of new life and are called to grow into maturity in Christ. As we grow in Christ, evil no longer enslaves us. Satan may tempt us to do evil, but the experience of growing in Christ ensures us to also experience the victory Christ obtained over Satan on the cross. Hence, we are admonished to crucify self daily and experience the joy of growing new every day in Christ. Through his life, death, and resurrection, Christ triumphed over Satan and had his evil forces. Because of this, the demonic forces have no hold on us who have accepted Christ. Throughout his life and ministry on earth, Jesus remained absolutely loyal to his Father and overcame every attack of Satan in his life. Through his death on the cross, Jesus defeated Satan and his demonic forces and made them a cosmic spectacle of shame and defeat. Evil no longer holds power over those in Christ. Through his resurrection, Christ triumphed over death, and because of this, we need not have any fear over death and indeed anticipate our own resurrection unto eternal life. By accepting what Christ has done for us on the cross, we become a new creation. Our sins are forgiven and we are reconciled to God. Our old life dies and a new life of righteousness begins. The new life is one of freedom from sin, fear, demonic possession. A born again Christian is a growing Christian, growing in Christ to full maturity. How do I measure up to some of the biblical marks of spiritual growth in Christ? As a person saved from sin, how do I reflect my growth in the spirit? Christian love and unity are essential marks of growing in Christ. How do I reveal this in my daily life? What is the role of Bible study, prayer, and service in Christian growth? And what changes am I ready to make in my life to accommodate these essentials? Can I grow in Christ without bearing fruits of righteousness? How is fruit bearing linked to spiritual maturity? Christian growth is a series of ba daily battles. What should I do in order to be a victorious Christian? Anybody want to respond to any of these questions? Well, I want to just talk about the uh, bearing fruit. And it's interesting that you know, if a tree is supposed to bear fruit and it's not, you know, something is wrong. And in much, you know, so you have like Jesus in the peril and his fig tree, how I didn't have figs and he cursed it and stuff. And so if the, if a fruit tree is not bearing fruit, that means there's something wrong with often the nutrition or the water or something, something's not quite right. And so in the same way in the Christian life, if we say we're a Christian, but we're not bearing the fruits, you know, there is something wrong with our nutrition. And so that's, I guess that would tie into the role of Bible study and prayer and sort of things as being sort of nutrition that uh, causes the fruit to grow. Yeah, and I just want to, to say this, that even, even a young tree 
you know, takes, takes more time to bear fruit. You don't really expect to get full fruit from a tree until about the seventh year, you know? And so I think, you know, we also need to be not too hard on ourselves when we don't see the kind of transformation that, that we might expect as fast as we'd like it. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, and just to tie in that again, going and also tying in with something else, uh, when you're born again as a new Christian, you're not born as an adult. When you're born, you're born as a, a infant in, in Christianity. And so many people think that once you're converted that you're supposed to be at a high level. I mean, that may not be the case. You know, and so we have to, it's good for people. A lot of people, if they tend to be perfectionists, and they get really down on themselves, oh, I'm not going the way I'm supposed to. We have to remember it's a process and it's a growth. Absolutely. I also, I also think that um, during times like this that we may not realize that there's growth going on because sometimes the discouragement can cloud that. But um, I think that there's been a lot of growth in our church besides and there's still the longing to get together and it's it's the oddest time that i could ever think of in my life but yet there's some unexplainable things that are happening and um you know i'm just really grateful for that amen and you know i i want to say this because you know sometimes we can be really hard on ourselves but um, I want to say this, that um, I believe that when we keep looking at Jesus and we see how perfect he is, we also will sense our own, our own um, uh, how, how far short we come to what he's like. And so we shouldn't let that get be discouraged because you know we will have maybe a clearer and clearer sense of of what god longs to do in us and so i i just want to encourage you don't be discouraged if you don't feel like you're you're where you you know want to be or whatever or even ought to be you know um god god loves us and he's going to grow us as we keep looking at him okay now let's read the commitment pastor phil thank it's you lord cut off a little bit that's as best i can do okay thank you lord for saving me from sin and from the snares of satan Thank you for making me a new person in and through Jesus. With the power of your grace, I will make Jesus the center of my life in order that I may grow to be like him. Is that your desire? Amen. Yes, Absolutely. Indeed. That's for yes, sure. Indeed. Okay, let's go on to the church. Okay, the church, and I'm going to say this, is not a building. The church is a community of believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In continuity with the people of God in Old Testament times, we are called out from the world, and we join together for worship, for fellowship, for instruction in the word, for the celebration of the Lord's Supper, for service to all mankind, and for the worldwide proclamation of the gospel. The church derives its authority from Christ, who is the incarnate word, and from the scriptures, which are the written word. The church is God's family, adopted by him as a community of faith. No, adopted by him as Children, its members live on the basis of the new covenant, 
The church is the body of Christ, a community of faith with Christ himself is the head. The church is the bride for whom Christ died, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. At his return in triumph, he will present her to himself, a glorious church, the faithful of all the ages, the purchase of his blood, not having spot or wrinkle, but holy and without blemish. When we become Christians, we become part of Christ's church. The church is described as Christ's body, and he is the head. Church members need to keep in con- close contact with Christ and with each other through meeting regularly for worship, even if it's on Zoom or faith or um, whatever, YouTube. The church is Christ's body. Christ is the head. The church is also described as Christ's bride, which he's preparing for the great marriage in heaven. Acceptance of Christ brings adoption into the family of God. Acceptance of Christ leads to separation from worldly practices. God had a special congregation in Old Testament times too. Christians need to meet together for worship and encouragement. We should invest our gifts, energies, and ability in building up the church. Christ has given his church authority and mission on the earth. Its authority is founded upon himself as the word of God and upon his word, the Bible. In answer to the members of prayers, Christ gives his church the ability to make decisions in harmony with his will. My mission as a church member is to lead others from the world into Christ's church. Personal application. What part did the church have in helping me come to know Christ as my Savior? Anybody want to answer that? It's a good, um, you have people there, the church to like help you and build you up and answer your questions and like a community, a community, a fellowship. Great, Michelle. Anybody else? I think sometimes that, uh, it's not so much, well, for some people it is, but for myself, it's not so much that the church brought me to salvation, but it deepened, it strengthened, and helped me confirm over time the commitment. Because you were just saying, you know, a few minutes ago that there are daily battles that you have to confront. And I think the church, if we take advantage of it the right way, um, helps us um as a congregation to endure those battles together and to lean on one another. Um, So, you know, there's something to be said for once being saved, but there's also something to be said for, you know, keeping your (laughs) faith tuned up and strengthened. Absolutely. You know, it's like this next question, why is fellowship with other believers important? And you've heard the story of the pastor that went and visited a member who had quit attending. And um, the man had a fire going in his living room, the fireplace, and the pastor didn't say anything. He just sat there, and after a few minutes, he took the poker, and he separated the logs. And then he just sat back, and he and... This man watched as the, the fire burned down and the logs became cold. And then he got up to leave. And the man understood the, the connection, you know, when you're separated, you know, when you choose to separate yourselves from, you know, the, the living fire, you know, Um, it's easy to get cold. And so, you know, God's desire for us is to help each other, to encourage each other, to support each other in those, in those trying times, in those dark times, you know, and rejoice with each other when times are, are going well. And what I find very helpful too, is hearing people's testimony. Um, I really enjoy hearing 
how God has spoken to them. Absolutely. And I think that's a rich part too of, of, for us, like in my Sabbath school class, when I teach, I, I ask people, how have, has God been working in your life this week? Because I want them to be intentional to realize that God is presently at work in their lives. And some may think, well, you know, I can't think of anything that stands out. But, you know, the more we share and the more we contemplate that, we realize that God is involved daily in our lives. You know, sometimes it's not noticeable, but many times we can see the finger of God in the orchestrating of events in our lives. All right, let's go on to the commitment. Father, with joy, I confess that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I rejoice that you have adopted me into the family of God. I want to unite with your body on earth. Be part of the family. Share your grace and church fellowship with others. Is that your desire? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right, Pastor Phil, we'll move on to the remnant and its mission. The remnant and its mission. The universal church is composed of all who truly believe in Christ. But in the last days, a time of widespread apostasy, a remnant has been called out to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This remnant announces the arrival of the judgment hour, proclaims salvation through Christ, and heralds the approach of his second advent. The proclamation is symbolized by the three angels of Revelation 14. It coincides with the work of judgment in heaven and results in a work of repentance and reform on earth. Every believer is called to have a personal part in this worldwide witness. In these last days, God has a special people called the remnant. They may be described as those who remain loyal to God, remain loyal to him in a time of terrible apostasy. And I just want to say this about the word remnant. You know, if, if you are into um, sewing at all, and you go to the store where you can buy cloth, like Joanne Fabrics, they usually have a bin or some place where they have remnants. And the remnant is what? A leftover piece of fabric. Yeah, it's the, it's, it's the cloth on the very end of the bolt, right? And so a remnant, when we describe a remnant in the church, it's God's last day people. And it's going to have all the characteristics that the whole rest of the bolt of cloth had. You know, and we know those characteristics are they keep God's commandments and they have faith in Jesus. So Revelation predicts that the remnant will exist after the persecution of the dark ages. It's God calls out his special remnant in a time of terrible apostasy. You're ahead of me. There you go. The remnant are faithful to God's commandments. The remnant have the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy, the prophetic gift. The remnant proclaim an urgent message about the commencement of the time of judgment, salvation through Christ, and the nearness of the second coming. They point to salvation through Christ alone. They proclaim the message of the judgment hour. The message is referent to the judgment that takes place in heaven before Christ returns to earth. They proclaim the nearness of Christ's return. Personal application. Why does the remnant need especially strong faith? Anybody? Well, because the remnant are dealing uh, with many last day things that. Um, you know, are, are unusual, just kind of like what we're going through right now. 
And you think of, of Noah, how hard would it be to be ridiculed for making a boat? Yeah. When nobody's seen a flood before. You know, you know, and it was such an ungodly age. And it's true in our society today, too. You know, there is much ungodliness around us. All right. Next question. What is the relationship between the faith of Jesus and obedience to God? Better connection to God. More fruitful. And do you think that when we when we love God that we're we want to please him? That we mm-hmm. You know that we aren't going to be in rebellion against him, but 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 we're going to, you know, um, desire to be like him. Amen. It's just, uh, in what ways can the Seventh Day Adventist Church? Well, hold it! I wanted to comment about that last one. I was going to, okay. in regard to what relationship. What is the relationship between faith of Jesus, the faith of Jesus, and obedience to God? Well, you can't be obedient to God without faith in Jesus. Okay. In what ways can the Seventh-day Adventist Church be identified with the remnant of the last days? Because they um, hold the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments of God? Yes, right. There's a lot of, a lot of churches that, you know... Um, don't emphasize um, the importance of, of obedience to God. I think also in the context of uh, what we looked at uh, several sessions ago on uh, Revelation chapter 14 and the three angels' messages, uh, that those are messages, the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 uh, are going to be their last day, uh, if their last day messages are going to be proclaimed in the last days. And mm-hmm. Uh, any church that is following the scriptures needs to be doing that. Mm-hmm. And you can, you can go down the checklist and, and quickly discover uh, that the number of churches and denominations in the world today uh, that are doing that are next to none. Well, most, uh, well, most, most um, churches, um, they, they, they really believe that the, the the Ten Commandments were abolished at the cross when when Jesus came to to fulfill, not to abolish, to show us that it can be fulfilled. All right. Um, next statement. It is especially challenging to live in these. Oh. Yeah, it is especially challenging to live in these last days. But the challenge brings with it the privilege of participating in spreading God's late last day message and helping people to prepare to meet Jesus at his second coming. And here's the commitment. Father, I want to be part of your remnant people in the last days. I'm answering your call and choose to, to follow Jesus in a life of faith and obedience with your guiding me. I will tell others of your special message for the end time. Is that your desire? Amen. 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 Hey, our next one. Any, any, any questions about that subject? Why do you suppose that So few few churches are teaching these things. You know, I believe that there are churches who um, they want to make people comfortable. 
and they're more concerned with having people comfortable than they are for them to to seek um, obedience and transformation. Agree, totally agree. I am not finding number 14. Uh, let's see. Oh, here it is. I found it. I found it. Sorry. Just found it. There we go. Right here. Okay. Should be up. Okay. Thank you. Unity in the body of Christ. The church is one body with many members, called from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In Christ, we are a new creation. Distinctions of race, culture, learning, and nationality, and differences between high and low, rich and poor, male and female, must not be divisive among us. We are all equal in Christ, who by one spirit has bonded us into one fellowship with him and with one another. We are to serve and be served with our without partiality or reservation. Through the revelation of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, we share the same faith and hope and reach out in one witness to all. This unity has its source in the oneness of the triune God who has adopted us as his children. I think that's one of the beautiful things about the Adventist church. You know, we may not do it perfectly, but um, we um, have this understanding that all of us are brothers and sisters. All of us are of one family, no matter if we're poor or if we're rich, no matter if we're educated or uneducated, no matter if we're, you know, high economic status or low economic status or if we're a gold collar worker or, you know, a, a farm laborer, we're, we are all one in Christ. One of God's gifts to his church is unity. Just as the Father, Son, and Spirit are one, so should the members of the church be united. As God's children, we are a united family. Despite their widely varied backgrounds, Christians are a new creation and are united in full equality in Christ. No matter what we were like before we accepted Christ, we become part of one body in him. There are no class distinctions in God's sight. In Christ, all class distinctions dissolve as we become one people, joint heirs of God's promise to Abraham. Love toward one another should characterize the members of Christ's body. Personal application. How can I contribute to the unity of my church? What do you think you can do? Probably pick up the phone more and reach out. And on a more, I guess, philosophical level, we can look at people as individuals and not a group of some subset, whatever, whatever box we want to have. Everyone has their own, but if we see people as a as a as an individual, not a representative of whatever thing, I think that can go a lot towards unity because then that would break down a lot of the barriers that we have, and we would be, like Eric said, more likely to pick up the phone if somebody um, if we're not building up these artificial barriers. Eric, yes, why don't you tell the group um, one of the reasons you liked our church when you first started coming. Are you putting words in his mouth, honey? Did, did I, I am. Yeah. He, he's yeah, actually, actually is done. Because she knows. Because when, the way you guys treated Abby was um, it's the epitome of what you're talking about right now. This day and age we live in the labels are, are there more labels put on stuff than than 
there are boxes in the store and it's, you know, everybody's got a, a, a label into what kind of American. There's a hyphenated this and that American, Hispanic American, African American. And, you know, I'm, I'm, try, I'm staying this side of the political. I don't mean to get that. What I'm just saying is everybody's labeling or themselves or labeling other people and they're putting everybody in a little box. And no wonder we're so dang divided. And, you know, I really like what you said there, Brent. And it makes, it, it makes sense that if you're doing that, you're more likely to reach out. Yeah. And, and you guys treat everybody that way and as a church. And I was very attracted to that. And it, uh, it reached me. Praise God. And that's, you know, that's the important thing, I, I think, that we need to realize that everybody, we're equal, you know, everybody's equal at the cross. And it doesn't matter if somebody, you know, doesn't have it totally together. We need to love people. We need to come beside them. We need to, to care for them, no matter what is the challenge. All right, let's move on Amen. to the, let's move on to the next one. Is it possible to maintain friendship with Christ while treating one of his children as an enemy? I got a question on that one. There there are people that do unspeakable and incredibly wicked things and that I'm having a hard time loving them, and I, I uh, there are people I've never met before, yeah, but um, I don't know what to do with that. There's some people I just don't know how to love them. And, and I think, you know, for me, I, I'll just share my personal testimony on that. I don't necessarily like what some people do, but it doesn't stop me from caring about who they are and showing them Christ's love. Um, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, uh, I had a twin sister of a different mother. We were, we were both born on the very same day in the very same year. We were born in two separate countries. She was born in Canada and I was born in the United States. And we roomed together in college for a little while. We even dated some of the same guys, although it wasn't at the same time. Uh, so, um, you know, yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't one of them. Just to just to let you folks know, I, <laughs> I, I, I never dated. I never dated the girl she's talking about. So so anyway, mm -hmm. my my friend Judy. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time, her family happened to live really, really close by. And so I, I happened to spend a lot of time with their family. In fact, the, the dean of men actually thought I was one of um, the daughters of the family. Um, and um, he actually went up to the father one day and said to him, you know, um, the um the guy your daughter's dating is really nice he's a really great guy and it wasn't phil it was another guy <laughs> and the funny part was um his real daughter what his other real daughter was dating a guy with the same name as the guy i was dating and so you know the professor i mean the the um my my girlfriend my twin sister we call ourselves twin sisters my twin sister's father was a little confused because um, his daughter was dating a guy who lived in the community and he wasn't in the dorm. And so he, he thought, well, how does he know him? So they started asking and come to find out he was talking about me. He thought I was part of the family. Well, I called him Uncle Al. You know, we were so close. I called him Uncle Al. And Uncle Al, um, when we graduated from college, left his wife. And, you know, I was devastated. Um, his daughters were devastated. It, it was just really heartbreaking. And Uncle Al 
got together with his wife for a little bit during the summer. Um, but, you know, eventually um, cut off the re relationship with them and got divorced. And um, Uncle Al would periodically come by where we lived and visit us. And um, I said to Uncle Al one day, I said, you know, I, I don't like the fact that you left your wife. Um, I said, I, um, but I want you to know that I'm not going to, I'm not going to harp on you about this. This is a choice you've made. I want you to know that you, you, I love you and you are welcome in my house anytime. I don't like what you did, you know, because, you know, it, it hurt the family, but I love you. And I think that's the way we need to be with people who we may not see eye to eye with. We can love them. We may not like necessarily the kinds of choices they make. I mean, they may make choices that hurt people, um, but we can still love them and ask, you know, God to help us be gracious to them. Does that make any sense? You know, it really does. My mom always, a phrase my mom used quite often was, hate the sin, not the sinner. Mm. Yeah, those people are a lot easier to love, you know, especially if you have times with them that are special to your heart that you can go back to. Um, I, I struggle with the ones that are super aligned with the enemy and they have made their choice already, seemingly. Perhaps they could be saved. And I guess I'm going to extremes, but um, there's such incredibly terrible and evil and wicked things that are going on in this world that people that have, have undoubtedly aligned themselves with the enemy and take pleasure in it. I have a hard time loving those folks. I know. That's that's the human nature, but you know, um, I, I and I fully understand what you're saying, Eric, because it's tough to it's tough to put ourselves in a situation where we um, where we have fond feelings towards somebody who is um, diametrically opposed to what we believe in and follow. Um, I think for that is even the case uh, for, for being spiritual, uh, committed Christian believers. And yet we think about what uh, the Apostle Peter wrote about, uh, about God uh, in his, uh, one of his epistles. He says, um, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so, you know, I mean, take a look at the fact that, that Jesus had incredible love for the human race. I mean, Talk about unlovable people, all of us. And yet Jesus was willing to come down and say, hey, listen, this, this, this uh, uh, group of people, this, these rebellious people are worth me committing time to uh, because it was all about proving that he is a God of love and, and, and care for. So, yeah, I, I realize that what you're saying, Eric, is a real challenge of the Christian life. You know, how do you put yourself to love people that – are not lovable and are diametrically opposed uh, to what we believe in. Yeah, it's it's really a challenge, and, and that's the challenge. And yet Jesus himself said, "By this will men, by this will all men know." It's John fifteen, uh, I think, verse thirty four or thirty five, somewhere right in there. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know, and I think. Um... I think also, you know, we have to ask God to give us that kind of love. It doesn't come naturally. You know, when I was fired from being a pastor by the Georgia Cumberland Conference, um, I was not happy. You know, I talked badly about administration, whatever. And I came to realize that I was responsible for the way I talked about them and they were responsible to God for the way they treated me. And so, you know, I could, I can look them in the face today and I can have a pleasant conversation with them. 
I don't like what they did, but I can still, you know, um, love them with Christ's love and treat them with grace. Now, one other thing before we wrap things up here, uh, Pastor Jan, and that is uh, uh, you need to go, and you said that that dean, that dean of men, uh, was talking about you and not Uncle Al's real daughter, um, and was commenting that, uh, about what he thought of the, of the guy you were dating. But you better tell him what he thought of me. Well, he thought my husband was so awesome that he hired him as an assistant dean. But before that, I wasn't talking about that, dear. Before that, what did he do 41 years ago yesterday? 41 years ago yesterday, he married Phil and I. That same dean of men was a pastor, and he married us. So he liked Phil, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, happy belated Way to go, way way to go. <laughs> Okay, so um, here it is. It, it is a privilege to be a part of the family of God. Where I go in the world, I can meet with brothers and sisters who will love me and treat me as one with them in Christ. And Phil and I have experienced that all over the world. Wherever we've traveled and we've worshipped with our, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, we have felt that love and that bond. Uh, it's wonderful to be part of the Adventist family. And here's the commitment. Because I'm grateful for your work in creating me as your child, I will treat others as my brothers and sisters in Christ, I will seek your help, Holy Spirit, to maintain peace, unity, and love in the church and wherever I am. Is that a commitment your desire? What? Yes. Is that your desire, that commitment? Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes, Amen. 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 Deal. Well, that's all the time we have uh, this evening, but I want to finish off. I'm going to put somebody on the spot. Um, she has no idea I'm going to put her on the spot, but I'm going to call on Becky right now to share just a little brief testimony, Becky, uh, because it wasn't uh, too many years ago. What was it, about 17, 18 years ago? Uh, you took this same journey, and uh, you, you made this same kind of commitment and uh, came to belief and become a part of the fellowship of the Adventist family here in Simi Valley. And I'm wondering if you could just give us a very short testimony about what that has meant to you uh, through the years as you took that journey uh, to become a part of the body of Christ. Yeah, it was 2003 is when my husband and I first started going to some evangelistic series that the Simi uh, SDA church had there. And it was in, we studied, well, it was really a lot of coincidences why what that brought us there but um we ended up studying about a year and a half before we actually joined the church because i had grown up a baptist so for me some of the the you know the, well the sabbath wasn't too hard because it's pretty clear in the bible but the state of the dead was kind of harder for me to deal with since i'd lost you know a lot of family members and i kind of had in my mind you know where I thought they were so it was harder to deal with that for me but um I am feel so blessed that God led us there I, I really feel that he did because there was all sorts of little things that happened before we started going there um and it's just been a real blessing I mean my husband died five years ago and without my church family without this this faith I have in God I don't think I could have gotten through it as well as I have um, I mean, for me, this, you know, this pandemic thing is nothing compared to losing my husband. That's the hardest thing I've done. But all my family and friends at church have helped me with that. And, and especially, you know, relying on God through all of that. Um, but, you know, we had studied all of these things, too. And I always like to listen again on Bible studies because every time I do, I learn something new. I feel like I'm still growing, even though I've been involved in the um the Simi church pretty heavily but i always feel like there's something to learn you know in studying always <laughs> but i'm just very grateful 
very grateful to God. Thank, thank you. Thank you, you, thank you so Thanks. much, Becky, for your testimony. I know that's meaningful. And like, like Kim was mentioning earlier, uh, the thing that's meaningful to her is people's testimony. And that's why I was thinking it would be meaningful uh, because you took that journey 17 years ago. Uh, it would be meaningful for you uh, and for others uh, to hear your personal testimony of what Jesus has done in your life and how he led you on that spiritual journey. So thank you so much. And thank you folks for your time tonight. And I just want to let you know that we are planning a baptism. Uh, Eric, I know we haven't connected. We'll have to connect uh, uh, with you and Antoinette uh, probably tomorrow sometime to get more specific. Oh, okay. But um, we are planning their baptism for this Sabbath afternoon. Um, at four o'clock, at four o'clock on Sabbath afternoon, uh, that will give us adequate time uh, to plan for it. And what we want to do is we want to give each of you, uh, we're only going to have a limited number of people here to watch it live. It will be live stream. We're only going to have a limited number of people uh, watching uh, the live stream of this, I mean, uh, watching the actual in-person baptism. Um, so, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to talk about that, uh, and if you would like to be a part of being here, uh, to be uh, among those who are watching it live. And so we'll give you that opportunity uh, after Pastor Jan has our closing prayer. Father in heaven, want to thank you so much for your word, for your love, for Jesus, for all how all of heaven is seeking to save humanity. And Father, our hearts are touched again as we contemplate how we can respond to the good news of Jesus, how we can love others, how we can be compassionate and um, be more like you. So work your perfect work in each of us. Help us to keep um, our eyes focused on you and not on others. Help us to see others through your eyes. And we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.